lot of really we have a lot of really exciting updates to share with you this morning. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, first, we're going to begin with proposals, and we're going to have information shared by Krista Hixenbaugh and Elisa Bunn, both of whom are interim associate directors over the proposal team. Great. Thank you, Kelly. Welcome, everybody. Hopefully, you all can see my screen in the presentation that's showing. Thank yep. you for nodding. We want to welcome you to this morning's Research Administration Forum. We have some new information that we'd like to share with you and some updates on the proposal team. One thing we want to make sure to share with you is that we have moved. And so we have a new address to share with you, as well as an update with Cayuse SP to make sure that everyone is appropriately entering the data into the IPF correctly. And we have an update to our budget template. So some of you may have learned that our Office of Research that was housed at Research Park, we have moved from that location. We are now back on campus and our address is as follows at One Shields Avenue. We wanna make sure that everyone utilizes this new address for any proposal preparations that they may be doing. If you have any questions about the addressing, please feel free to reach out to the assigned analyst or email proposals at research, excuse me, proposals at ucdavis.edu. The other item we want to make sure to mention is that under the preparation of the Cayuse SP when creating your IPF for your proposals, there's a few things that we want to make sure that's cleared up so that our reporting to the Office of the President is accurately reflecting of the proposals, the proposed sponsors we are working with. For example, when you're submitting a proposal, and it's only being funded directly to UC Davis, that sponsor should only be listed under the sponsor, the sponsor name. The prime sponsor would be left blank, as an example showed below for NIH. If we are working with a flow through, that is when we will utilize the prime sponsor field. So for example, if the University of Florida is submitting a proposal to USDA, and UC Davis is a subaward on Florida's proposal, we wanna make sure to reflect that appropriately. The prime funding where the origination of the funds are coming from is USDA. The sponsor in which is directing their funding to UC Davis is the University of Florida. And we will receive a subaward with flow down terms from USDA under that Florida subagreement. That's That example shown is how your IPF should be reflected. There's a, some confusion that both fields need to be completed and they do not. So we wanna make sure that to please do not duplicate the sponsors when it's being funded by a single funded funder based on that proposed project. So when you see the example below it reflecting NSF twice, that is incorrect. We wanna make sure that that prime sponsor is left blank. Unfortunately, when we enter that sponsor and it's not a subcontract or a sub uh, flow through from a sub as a sub award agreement. We give the wrong reporting information to the office of the president as if this is a flow through and it's not. So we need to make sure that we do not duplicate these fields. Does anybody have any questions so far? Chris, I just wanted to add that if you accidentally do add a prime sponsor and, and you want to remove it, you have to um, none or no sponsors, right? You can't just completely remove it. So that's fine if it ends up saying none. That is an excellent point. Thank you for pointing that out. Yes, you would identify none and then that's completely fine. It it, it takes away um, the reflection of a sub award when there isn't one. So thank you for that clarification, Lisa. Any other questions or comments? All right, so now we're gonna move to we want to present to you the, the new, I, I'm sorry, this should say update, I apologize, um, the updated OR budget template with by Elisa Bunn. As you all know, Elisa is excellent in helping generate a template that the campus community can use that simplifies your life and reduces headaches when preparing your budgets for all the things that we need to address to our sponsors. So I will stop sharing and let this go transition into Elisa's presentation and demonstration. Thank you all. 
Okay. So we're always looking, of course, to process improvement. And we hadn't changed our OR budget templates, the personnel section, in a while. And so Chris and I had been talking to um, all of you on campus and your, your daily budgeting and got some feedback on how to make things a little bit easier or what you would like to see. So we made a few changes to our current template. Um, and so I just wanted to demo a bit. This is now online and Perry has wonderfully um, updated our FAQs to give you more information so you can go through those. Thank you, Perry. Um, and I believe he's also working on a new video um, to help. But um, the, the new um, template, as you can see right here on my screen, um, can everybody see it? Yes, okay, great. Um, and now when you open the new template, it's, there's going to be two sections here. And I'm going to show you how they work briefly and then also how if you don't want to use one section or the other, you can you can um, hide it. So now when you open the personnel section up here, you'll see that there's two spots. There's one that is labeled pre-selected as months and a section that's pre-selected as percent. So the intention here is, let's say we're adding our professor up here and they've told you they want one summer month. So before we had to figure out what is one summer month, we were annualizing salary to kind of figure out the overall um, effort that took a while, it took extra math, you had to think about it. So in this case, let's say we're just gonna put Dr. Peach um, and Dr. Peach just said, I want one summer month. This is a nine over 12 faculty. The first thing you wanna do is change the appointment type here. This is really important to nine over 12. They wanna take summer salary. You just have to enter their base salary for nine over 12, not their three month summer, but their nine over 12. So let's just say Dr. Peach makes 100,000 for their base salary. So we're gonna put that in there. They want one month, we're gonna put one month in here. We're just gonna put a one. Um, and that's going to calculate one summer month. Um, again, you could put 0.5, right? And it'll be 0.5 summer month. So really easy. You don't have to do anything, but mark this as nine over 12 and you know, put in their nine over 12 base salary and then it'll calculate one month for you. So you don't have to do any kind of salary. So if this person were 11 over 12, I would just change it and you would see it would update to one eleventh of their salary. If you wanted to know what this was in annual effort, then you just go over here to the personal reference page and it tells you what the annual effort would be like for entering an SP and so forth. It's, it's right here, so you don't have to figure that out. Um, so, and then you can, if you wanna budget by percent, you just do it the traditional way. But again, let's say Dr. Peach has some, uh, also AY effort. So that was summer, but they said, okay, I also want 20% during the academic year. You still want to put your 9 over 12 here. You want to put your AY here. Um, you put your 9 over 12 base salary here. And then you could just put your 20%, right? Um, and that's your, your AY. And then, you know, down here, you'll know how to pick your different fringe. Um, so let's say, um, so you can have a mix in here. You could put all your grad students here. You could put grad students up here and put 4.5 months. Let's say you don't want to use months at all. You just, you're at the med center. You're only using um, percentages. You don't want this to be here. Just highlight the lines you don't want over here and then click hide. And now you have a spreadsheet that's just percent effort. There's more lines down here. You can see how it skips lines, 38 to 53. Just highlight both of those and then click unhide and you have you have, you know, a lot more lines here. Um, you can do the same thing up here. You can tell that there's some lines hidden here between 15 and 23. You can unhide more in this section. Okay, so what if you don't want your faculty effort mixed here? You don't wanna put person months here, you would like it like right after each other. That's also a possibility on this, but just because of the constraints of Excel, you have to do a little bit more work. So let's say we wanna put Dr. Peach's AY up here. So when I show you, you can do the same thing. Let's go back to nine over 12. This is gonna be our AY. I'm gonna put in 100,000 here. I still wanna do 20%. I can change this to percent, but here's the thing with Excel. There's a formatting that now changes this to percent, but you still have to enter it as a number because you cannot have only one underlined. So if I wanted 10% or 20%, I'd have to put 0.2 for this to work. Um, if I put in 20, what would happen would be it comes out as 2,000, which you wouldn't want. Um, so you have to do decimals if you're going to 
if you want it up here in this section. Um, the other option would be to take this whole line and go up here and put percent, and then you can enter as if it were percent. So it gives you flexibility to use these together, but you have to just do a little bit of formatting work there. Um, you can also hide this row if you had a, a really large number of personnel, and then, um, you know, unhide all your extra spaces here. And you can tell this gives you, you know, quite a bit more lines to add personnel if you just want a seamless, um, seamless budget. Um, so I think, I think you'll find this much easier to do your budgeting. You don't have to annualize. You can just use person months if you want to. Um, the other thing we did is we took out the fiscal year escalations because there was a lot of confusion about, okay, enter 100,000 here um, and I put, you know, 20%. This doesn't equal 100,000 times 20 because at the fiscal year, there's 3% escalation and I have to figure out what that is. And sponsors were coming back and saying, why doesn't this equal? And so right now um, with this 3%, what you'll notice is it just goes into effect, you know, the next year. So if you want pre-escalations like year one escalations, you can just build that into your salary base or you can use our custom escalation. So we have this new custom escalation here. If you go to custom and then go to here to the personal reference, you can enter any amount of customization here for your personnel. Um, so you could enter 12%, you think uh, 4.5, 4 your professor is gonna have a merit, you could do 22%, you know, and it'll, it'll custom escalate on that line for Dr. Peach. So that's also a possibility. Um, and so you can build in your escalations like that. Um, the other thing that we did was we eliminated the three kinds of summer salary. So that it's just faculty summer. So you don't have to think about all the different faculty summer because that was causing some confusions too. And also for sponsor, like how is it split? So if there's just one faculty summer, if you have summer, effort, you want to use the fringe rate, and it's going to use the highest rate applicable to the summer period. Um, so there won't be a split rate for summer. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to mention was some people have asked me, what about when, a, when an award comes in? I have to update my budget, and maybe it just moved two months. How do I avoid having all the salary and fringe change when an award comes in and like it, it just goes a month? The thing is, with this new um, spreadsheet, without having the fiscal year escalations, your salary is not gonna change um, when you change months. So that's a good news. It's not gonna, it's not gonna change your escalations to salary because they started in the, the second period. It will change a fringe rate if you have escalations. So some uh, common um, fixes for that is you can use our federally negotiated um, fringe rates and that'll keep them static, um, you know, throughout the project based on what's on our rate agreement, or you can choose, um, you know, period one only, depending on um, depending on how your your project period shifts, this could cause a little bit of change. So if you really are concerned about your your budget changing based on the start date, using our NICRO rates is acceptable. Um, so that's an option for you as well. Um, one more change on here. Um, down here in the, uh, you know, in the um, tuition and fees, these rates will now change based on whether you pick resident or non-resident. So you can use, you don't have to pick the line or look it up. You can just change it to resident or non-resident and then go forward on each line. So I think that'll be helpful. Right. Perry, can you think of anything else that you would want to highlight based on our conversation? Uh, just that in the personnel rows, mm -hmm. you can add additional details. So you can add Dr. Peach and then in parentheses, you can say, this is the <clears throat> summer or this is the academic yes. year. Yep. And that information will help you when you go to the personnel reference to make sure you're actually customizing the correct line. Mm -hmm. so the information is helpful for you and for the people reviewing, it can help clarify. Mm -hmm. And there's some notes here too, if you forget how each of these rows work. And we do, we do have a question that's come in that says that we get our salaries from UC PATH funding. Is this a composite rate of 100%? And is that correct to enter for the salary? 
for UC Path, the salary that you get, it should be the base salary. Like if they're a nine over 12 faculty member and you're looking at their, you know, Professor AY, that, that should be the correct base salary to enter. The Med Center is a little bit different, um, you know, because there's different components to that. There's, you know, the Y and the Z. So um, it's definitely not our area of expertise. Looking in UC Path, we don't have access to salaries, but your base salary would be the normal salary that you're the university pays you on a general basis. I don't know if that answers the question. I think in the past, I've, I've been told that the the base sa annual salary we see mm -hmm. like in UC Path, mm -hmm. um, that we need to, that's based over 12, I don't know, I thought we were told we have to divide it by nine and, you know, like that it actually is a higher number than what we see in there. So that's not base salary. The thing is you, uh, when you're when you're determining annual effort for effort reporting, generally you wanna say how much has a faculty worked over the entire year. So if you work one month, add summer salary, like if they work three months over the summer, that one month is is 8.3%. If they work 10 months, that one, month is 10% effort. And so we annualize just to avoid over committing in the past, but mm -hmm. we've solved that on this sheet where you don't have to do that anymore. You just put the base salary and then there's an automatic annualization of effort here based on if we have 12 months of effort, this okay. is what the annual effort is. So okay. you don't have to do that. It just simplifies it all together. So That's yeah. great. So we can just put in the, the, the annual academic salary that we see and, and the mm -hmm. spreadsheet does the rest. Oh, Correct. Okay. Yeah. You just have to be sure to pick the correct appointment type here. Got it. Okay. Thanks. And then if you really, uh, if you had a nine over 12 faculty member and you wanted to use calendar months, let's say you you know that they're at the NIH cap over 12 months and you want to use it, then you, you want to be sure to, you know, if you're using a 12 month basis, use 12 over 12 and put that annualized salary here if you're using calendar months. That's something I think is pretty specific to NIH. Some people do that for their nine over 12 faculty. Okay, I have a question um, for the uh, B remissions uh, for mm -hmm. non-resident. Does it remove? Does it take into consideration the second, and third year rebates? Um, I think what you would want to do in that. Are you, do you mean that they would only be non-resident in year one? Yes. Yeah. So in that case, you would want to do something like one non-resident in year one, and then go down to a resident and do one like this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Even though it's just one person, so that, you know, you're budgeting how you wanted to budget. Great question. And another question that has come in is, is how to use the two different um, pers uh, personnel sections at the between the calendar months and the percentage. So somebody identified um key personnel or faculty use the top portion and other personnel can use the percentage portion in the second category. You can use either however you would like. It's mm -hmm. not mandatory how you use it. We're just giving you the flexibility of what you can do in your preparation of it. Some will utilize the key personnel at the top because it's easier to helping doing the data entry for the faculty and their summer salary that they're requesting. Okay. Just as an example, if you had a DSR, you could use it up here and you could say 12 over 12 calendar because DSRs, whether they're working in the summer or not, they really have a, this is their 12 month appointment mm -hmm. amount. So let's just say they get paid that. You could say 50%, you could put in six months. That's going to be the same as if I put this down here and put 50%, it's going to come out to the same amount. So it's just whether you want to think in person months or you want to think in percentages or depending on what your sponsor wants. Mm -hmm. Lisa, there's a question about escalation in the chat. Sure. Does the multi-escalation feature allow for increases coming at different times of year? GSRs on October 1st, others on July 1st, for example? You would want to think about how you wanted to build that in by using the custom, I think. So it's not automatically... When you just put 3% here, there's going to be no escalation here, and you're going to start 3% here and here. So you want to think about what at the start of the grant, what your salary is going to be um, and build in those escalations here, you want to use that custom feature. So you want to move to custom and then you want to think about adding for that line item. What do you expect 
um, your increases to be in each year. So you, you figure those out by uh, manually and put them in here, but it allows you to vary it however you want to. So that custom feature can be really helpful when you have those varying escalations. Right. Any other questions? And right now we have template A updated with these features and uh, we're gonna be rolling out all the other templates with these features at the top um, soon, as soon as they're available. Right. I think that's it then. For proposals, if you have any questions, be sure to reach out to us at proposals at ucdavis.edu. And here's our, uh, here's our website too. All right. Thank you, Kristen. So that was excellent information. Okay. Um, next, we have B. Rand Strong, who is Interim Associate Director for Awards and Subawards. Um, take it away, B. Hello, everyone. It's going to be a tough act to follow. I don't have quite as much fun things. Um, but I'd like to provide a couple updates for the awards team. So we have some hiring updates we're happy to announce. We are, we've already hired um, two external new senior analysts for the awards team. And we've also promoted one person to the senior analyst in the awards team. Um, additionally, we still have a couple positions in progress. We have uh, three research administrative threes in the awards team that we're in progress with, and also one research administrative three on, that's contract on the sub-awards team. So we are moving through and we thank you all for your patience. Along with that, um, so please know that we are doing our absolute best to work on the awards as soon as we can um, throughout our um, process. But we ask that you please give us 10 business days to process the award documents. We're looking at a lot of compliance, getting the budgets and whatnot. Um, so if you haven't heard within 10 business days, please reach out to the analyst directly that is um, in the email that's sent out through Cayus that should have the analyst name to reach out to. Um, and if you uh, can help us with the processing time by sending us a budget, if you know that the award is lesser potentially more than what was budgeted for. If you could prepare a budget and send to the analyst that has the correct start and end dates and the budget that matches the award itself, that would be really, really helpful for us and, and keep things moving. So we really appreciate that if you can um, help with that. And so a summary is just that we're working as hard as we can and we just thank you all. So um, that is really all I had. If you would like to reach me directly, um, my email is at the top here, and then we also have the awards general email and the sub awards general email. So that was it for me. Is there any questions I can help with at the time? Yes, B, I had a quick question. So when we provide that budget, um, does, do the exact line items need to match the NOAA? Um, I'm particularly thinking of the indirect costs and um, any other, you know, summarized subsections? Um, as long as it doesn't change within the, the awards have different amounts that you are allowed to move uh, within automatically. So as long as you're not triggering that, um, some of them are $1,000, some of them are 25%. So that would depend on the award. Yeah. Um, so if there's a specific one you have a question with, feel free to, to reach out to the analyst and say, um, you know, the our indirect rate has, for example, changed. So we've had to move some out of, let's just say, materials and supplies. And that way we can take a look at it, make sure that doesn't trigger a um, request to send to the sponsor that we need prior approval. Okay, great, thanks. You're welcome. I just wanted to reiterate that I know everybody on awards is working really hard. Um, we're working really hard to add staff to the team and get them trained. Um, so again, thank you for your patience. Okay, thank next you, up. Thank you for your hard work. <laughs> I know it's rough over there, so we appreciate you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Mario Reina Guerrera, who is representing contracts and grants accounting. Welcome, Mario. Mario, you're muted if you're talking right now. That would help too. Um, I'm on my hotspot right now having internet issues. So if I break up, um, let me know if I start to sound uh, 
pixelated. I wanted to give some updates. Um, really, I want to focus on two key topics today. One is a topic that's um, I know there's been a lot of communication about. Um, it's the end dates in Aggie Enterprise. And then we're also going to um, have some updates on communication channels with CGA. So uh, just, I didn't have this on the agenda, but um, CGA is continuing to do the recruitment for the replacement director um, that's in progress. And um, so moving forward, getting through fiscal close, um, I think we're, we're going along uh, decently for our first fiscal close in Aggie Enterprise. But I want to put the focus on the topic of end dates. I know there's been a lot of tickets open around end dates. There's been some confusion with how end dates work. In Aggie Enterprise, um, the confusion was only made a little bit more muddled with um, the issues that we had with different implementations of APIs and validation services. So hopefully I can clear some of that up. Uh, one caveat is that this presentation is the way that Aggie Enterprise works with dates. I know that there are a lot of business needs to have dates um, function a little bit differently, but I, I don't want to go down that road on this presentation. This is just to kind of convey how dates work. Um, if you have those other scenarios, uh, please feel free to, you can reach out um, and do our ticketing system so we can look at the individual um, needs of how these dates are set up. But this is really intended to capture probably that 95% of the way dates are set up to function in Ag Enterprise. So let's go here. So there's really in Ag Enterprise, there's, there's the important dates to keep in mind and the confusion really is um, surrounding the first two bullets there, the award end date, which if you're looking in the view, and I have a, um, a print screen of, of some of these screens to make a little bit more sense. But the award end date um, is actually the end of the performance period of an award. It's also referred to as a budget period end date. And the way we're setting up awards in Aggie Enterprise, um, award end date will also be the contract end date. So those three are somewhat synonymous in Aggie Enterprise, award end date, budget period end date, and contract end date. Then there is the concept that um, some, some users has, have referred to as a closeout period or cleanup period, that the amount of time that you have after an award has ended to actually do the closed um, steps that you need, whether that be um, trailing payroll that comes in after the award end date um, or what have you. And the third date is really the project finish date, which for sponsored um, awards with one task, we cascade the project finish date to be the same as the task finish date. So those will be the same. There won't be a, a variation between those two. Um, so what do these look like? If you're looking at a screen, uh, this is in the award screen. You're going to see the budget period start date and the budget period end date. Those are synonymous with the performance period of your award. And then you're going to see um, the close date. So what we're doing now is that we are matching the close date for the close period of the award. For example, if it's a 90-day close, we are setting all the awards are set up with a 90-day uh, gap between the end of the award end date and the close date. Um, this one's not the greatest example because it's only set a month later, but this is one of the challenges that people are seeing, and I'll get into that in a bit. So again, this is looking at the award screen. There's the award close date. Now at the project screen, um, there's the project finish date. So the project finish date on the awards being set up, we're setting equal to the award close date. So you have that same gap, um, that same close period for the award and for the project. 
So the important notes on dates, um, and this is really kind of the heart of where the where the um, issues are. are. Um, first of all, we're going to use Aggie Enterprise functionality to enforce closed dates on awards. And what I mean by that is if we have an award, let's say that has a 90 day close, we're going to set those parameters so that the close date and the project finish date are set to 90 days. After that, we're going to let Aggie Enterprise enforce those dates. Um, we have to we have to close awards. We we have to. The functionality was there for a reason, and we don't want to leave it open ended, so that awards um, can continue to post uh, new costs. So, with that said, if you again, if you have an award that's got a, a different need beyond that, um, those are the that's the population of the tickets that we can work on. Right now, the population of our tickets is, is wide ranging. It's really because we're still dealing with um, the, the way dates migrated into the system and we had other issues, um, which leads to the next bullet. So further adding confusion to the way dates were working is we had two validation um, systems, if you will. Uh, we had an API that was looking at the status of an award. And then we also had an I-370 web service validation that was looking at UC Path. Um, UC Path was also looking at status. Status in Aggie Enterprise, um, once a, a cost is in Aggie Enterprise, status does not limit your ability to post costs. And by that, I mean, once an award has passed its award end date, it automatically goes into a status of expired but that status does not impede um, us from being able to post any costs. Um, we've had tickets requesting that we change award end dates. That was a really a, a direct um, impact from the API and the I-370 issues because the only workaround was to change the award end date to then modify the status. And we're not gonna do that. Um, that is a modification of the of the performance period that we have to we have to leave that um, intact. So we won't change any award end dates. And that might be that the request was really to change a close date, but the award end date, that's why I wanted to clarify that terminology that there is a difference between an award end date and an award close date. Um, if we do have a pending amendment, please open a ticket on that if you know that something's coming, um, but we're going to be running up to an award um, end date. Um, open a ticket. Uh, we're, we're trying to, you know, trying to work through these things as fast as we can. We have a big uh, population of amendments that come, as you can imagine, and awards, sub-awards, all of that activity is going through um, our awards management team. But just that it's a key point right here that we're not going to be changing award end dates. So if you opened a ticket and it got closed because you requested an award end date, um, hopefully we put in that kind of clarification on why that wasn't being changed. So we know right now that there's a big population of awards that need to be updated that came through the migration um, that had a very restrictive close period. In some cases, it was 30 days. In some cases, it was um, some were even set at zero close. So when costs were coming in from the boundary applications, they were failing. Um, they were not posting. They were either going to DKOs or they were ending up as unprocessed costs. So we have been working through um, a bulk update, a JIRA, to get the bulk updates in place. That is in the, we've already tested it in Dev 1, Dev 2. Um, we're it's being um, configured for deployment. Uh, we do have to do a slide modification once that is ready to go, uh, just to update the, the awards that will be part of that update because we have made a decent number of updates since we first started on that. So we don't wanna, we don't wanna undo changes that we've already made. So we're pushing that as, as fast as we can um, to get that implemented because I know that there's still there's still awards out there that need to be updated. 
Um, but just to clarify, our process that we put in place probably, I think it was about two months ago going forward, was all new awards that are being set up. We're setting up with that um, that portion of, or that closeout period equal to the closeout period of the award. So the last um, point I wanna make here, and this is an important one also, is that the close period is a shared period. And what I mean by that is, if we have 90 days to close an award, that's 90 days for all a campus. It's not just campus and CGA needs um, part of those 90 days as well to do final reporting. And import, um, equally important is our cash draws. Uh, we have to, if we have 90 days, well, that means in 90 days, those funds will be removed from our cash draw systems, um, whether that be uh, PMS, ASAP, um, any of the other draw systems. Uh, they're getting very strict that as soon as those days are up, those funds are removed from the system and we can't draw. Uh, what happens at that, in that situation is that we have to request, um, we have to request a special uh, opening on why those funds were not drawn during that close period. Um, Equally important right now, we have some of these systems where we have to put in the final FFR prior to doing the final draw. So it used to be that we could go in and do the draw, and then they would we would submit the FFR. Um, when PMS went away from doing a sub sub account uh, reporting on a quarterly basis, now we're entering FFRs into the same system that we're drawing. So they're matching up those records. If they, if we're requesting a final draw equal to our FFR, but the FFR has not been submitted, there's a mismatch and we're not allowed to draw. So that again, requires that we have more time to do those draws. So I hope that somewhat cleared up. I know the end dates are not super intuitive um, in Ag Enterprise. Uh, it, the dates do have a functionality that we want to leverage. So we know we don't want to go to the point where we're opening up these dates um, to have an open period and not enforce kind of that closed period of the award. So I, the team was on, the leadership team's been on um, fielding questions. So let's see, do we have any? So it looks like Lenore answered the question on individual projects of multiple closed dates. Um, oh, one important thing to note, when we're looking at a project finish date and an award closed date, Aggie Enterprise is going to look at the most restrictive date. And by that, I mean, if you have a, let's say you have a project finish date of June 30th, but you have an award close date of July 31st. Ag Enterprise is going to stop at the most restrictive date, so it's gonna stop at June 30th. So that's the importance of making sure that when we set these up, the project finish date and the award closed are the same. Otherwise, you could have requested that your project be extended and it was extended, but if the award wasn't extended also, the award close date, you're going to, have those costs, not those. That was an, one clarification I wanted to make. Um, I saw a hand raised, but no, I don't see a question. Oh, Cindy, go ahead. Hi, good morning. So I noticed they have a project that has a, a close date and it's a close date of the, it's, it's um, it has like three years of funding but the close date is showing the end of that funding period. Although when I checked with the funder, it's that's not the close of the funding. That was just the close that they've just, they just funded us to September 30th. So do I need to request it to be changed to the end of the project? Or yeah, if you have, if you have a, a scenario like that, please open a ticket so that we can okay. evaluate those. Um, and that, that's kind of that population I was 
okay. referring to that that I know that these I'm talking about probably the 95%, it might be lower, um, of the situations where the the dates are enforceable in that manner. But we we understand that they're that's not gonna apply to everybody. Okay, thank you. Hi, Mario. Um, yeah, can you confirm is the project finish date the same as the award end date or the award close date? How does that work? Um, it will be set. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll be set equal to the award close date. So the award end date is synonymous with the performance period of the award. Correct. So we're not we're not changing that because to change the award end date would be to modify the performance period. So we're we're leaving the award end date. Let me go back to that slide. Um, we're leaving the award end date as is. Um, yes. So let me close this. So this is really the screen probably that's the heart of this issue is the the difference. I know I don't know if people can see my cursor. Um, but really, it's the difference between these two dates is creating the confusion mm -hmm. um, because people are looking at an end date. And I don't, I think that the, the departments, you have this view only. Um, so I'm assuming that you can view this. You just can't edit it. Mm -hmm. um, so on a new award, let's say it has a 90 day close. This close date will be set 90 days after the award end date. Okay. During that 90 days, costs can post to um, the right. project. Mm -hmm. So one of the challenges initially with, with how this was configured was really around how expenditure dates were going to be feeding from the boundary applications. So the initial thought was that costs that would come in would, would come with the associated expenditure date. So Aggie Enterprise would know, oh, this, this expense was from, let's say from, in this case, it was from May. Mm -hmm. um, so it would post because this is before the end date. Mm -hmm. But that expense is coming from May, but it's carrying um, the transaction date. Let's say it, it could be in, in after 831. That's the date that Aggie Enterprise is going to be valid. So that's why initially the way um, the dates were configured it was taking that into account, that Aggie Enterprise would be able to distinguish between an expenditure date and the accounting date or transaction date. Mm -hmm. So that's really at the heart of why, why things became a challenge. Okay. Um, we think we've worked through the, we've worked through the, you know, identifying how the dates worked, um, the impacts of that. We worked through the validation systems that were looking at status. So really, we've we've seen a decrease in the tickets um, for end date issues. But again, if your scenario does not fit into that ninety five percent, please open a ticket, and we'll work with you on 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 what how to set these up. Uh, let's see. So CC note, um, we we tried to do some kind of um, your question of sixty days versus um, ninety days. There is no there is no um, um, you know, intervals for one group or the other. If we set we we played around with well, what if we set the project at sixty and the award close at ninety? Um, Again, an Aggie Enterprise is looking at the most restrictive date. So it's going to stop at 60 days. It doesn't matter that you've set the award close date at 90. So that's maybe down the road if we're able to come up with some way to do that. But right now, that's why I say it's a shared, those are shared days. Those 90 days mean 90 days for UC Davis, which is campus and the central unit of CGA. Uh, looks like Lenora even on. Uh, 
thanks for Lenora and, you know, the team. Um, they've been hard at work really fielding a lot of these questions at office hours. I know that's come up a lot. Uh, that was the main purpose of kind of having this presentation in this forum. Uh, want to get the information out. I know that just one presentation doesn't clear up everybody's questions, but um, I think we're we're in a better place right now with the way dates are functioning in Ag Enterprise. So. Good morning, Mario. One quick question. So yeah. uh, UC path will take uh, the most restrictive date, right? Yeah, it's UC path really is it's, it, all of, all of the systems are using the dates once the once the transaction is in Ag. You saw in UC path um, as early as last week before the update last Monday night, the fix went into the I three seventy web service validation. Um, that's when you were seeing a status error, which is different. So the status error was there um, because the I three seventy was looking; it was it was validating the status of the award. Um, so if the award end date had passed, it was pulling that as a status of um, expired, and then it was saying, "Well, this is expired. It's not an it's not a status that yeah. was listed as acceptable." Mm -hmm. So you were getting that error. You should not see those errors anymore. If you do get a status error um, in a UC path transaction, like a salary cost transfer, please escalate that to um, to us. Open a ticket. Um, if you could provide the print screen so that we could, you know, have your error, so that we can escalate that to the service delivery team that's that's um, managing those issues. Okay. Thank you. Uh huh. Um, I wanted to kick it over for an update to Tammy Costelli. We want to also talk about communication channels with CGA. As you know, a main thoroughfare now is going through our ticketing system, but we also have different um, inboxes that we've been using. So Tammy, are you ready? I could stop sharing here and let Tammy talk about our communication lines. Good morning. Uh, just to let you know, we are discontinuing the use of the AskCGA at ucdavis.edu email. And currently, there's an out-of-office message for campus. And we're asking that if you're inquiring about a ticket that has already been assigned, to contact that assignee directly. If you have submitted a ticket and it hasn't been assigned to someone, you can send an inquiry to EFA at ucdavis.edu. And if you haven't submitted a ticket with your question, we're asking that you do so in ServiceNow. You also have the option, if you have a specific question about your award, that you can contact the grant administrator or the contract administrator of the award and all other inquiries can be sent to the EFA at ucdavis.edu email. So someone's asking how to find the grant administrator. So we do have um, KBAs in the out of office reply, um, but I can put those in chat on how to find the grant or contract administrator. I mean, how, yeah, um, how do we know who a ticket has been assigned to? So if you go into uh, your, your ticket up top, it should say who the agent is working on the ticket. I don't see that. So I'm thinking of um, where the, the state, the status of the ticket is work in progress. And so no one has, um, that I can tell, has been assigned or has started working on it. So if it hasn't been assigned, I know we do have a team that's working diligently every day on assigning tickets. But if it hasn't been assigned or you can't find out who 
uh, the assignees, you can send a message to the EFA at ucdavis.edu email. Got it. Great. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tammy. Um, so there's a question, what is a reasonable time to wait for a ticket to be assigned? We have uh, staff working on that daily. So I would say hopefully just a day or two. And we do have office hours daily. Um, if you have some questions and you're not sure who should address those. And I think with the office hours, we've got a break uh, maybe next week, but the office hours will resume. Um, we haven't really set a sunset date for office hours. We're going to continue them um, as, you know, as long as they're being attended and the, they're useful. I think, I think uh, they're becoming pretty useful across across all the different units, not just CGA. So, but I think the frequency is going to just be Tuesday through Thursday going forward. Yeah, I think that's it for CGA, Kelly. All so, right, thanks Mario. Oh, I see Ashley has her hand up. Hi, so Tammy, you're saying if we submitted something like two weeks ago and it's not assigned to someone that that doesn't sound right or? Correct. Okay. Yeah, if you have a scenario, Ashley, you can, um, you can send me a note uh, offline if you have something like that. Okay, thanks. Um, Tony and Mario, what's the best way if we do need to contact um, for, I have several service tickets in um, for closeout stuff for SPO. Um, and if there hasn't been movement, do we, is the best way to get in touch with the agent back through the, um, the ticketing system or should I email them directly? I don't, I don't want to be bombarding them, but sometimes. Yeah. yeah. If you send it through the ticket, it does get, it generates the email. Um, so that's probably just to keep the communication. Yeah, I like to keep because you can imagine packed from different, you know, different. Yeah, directions. and it helps. It helps tie tie the specifically what ticket we're referring to because we've sent an email, then we have to go into the system and pull it. So that's yeah. we're, we're trying to refine the use of service now because that's going to be our main conduit for okay. for asking, you know, for projects to be set up and so forth. So certain actions that CGA has to be taking. Okay, yeah, I follow up like every three weeks or so just to, yeah, but I just have been doing it in the system, so I just wanted to make sure that that's the best way to do it, so, okay, thank you. I would say, though, if you're not mm -hmm. getting a response, um, to go ahead and send a message um, to the EFA at ucdavis.edu email because the supervisors are going through those, okay. and um, we can help escalate the issue. Okay, I've done that maybe once or twice when the sponsor is upset, but um, yeah, I try not to. I know you guys are overwhelmed, so I'm trying not to, but I have a, I have a definite backup since last November, basically, of a lot of closeout stuff that I can't complete. So uh, okay. good to know. Thank you. Sure. Renee, did you have a question? Hi, yeah. Um, I had placed the ticket a while back. Um, we had a conversion issue where the project, um, there's credits under the incorrect financial org, and the ticket was signed, assigned to somebody, and then they said that, so she says that sh we cannot update the org code after the expenses hit it will need to be reviewed by a supervisor and they will take the necessary steps unfortunately i had already updated the org when told this please create a service mail ticket with the organization credit issue and it will be reviewed and updated accordingly so is this something that needs to be this is something that 
so we need I need to place a new ticket now. I'm just a little confused. I don't know if hey, I can. If forward. you can email me the uh, this is Lenora. If you can email me that incident number, um, uh -huh. because changing an org on a a converted project or award, it's not just a matter of updating that. We then have to reclassify the the expenses and revenue, and so there's more to it than just making that change. So uh -huh. that's that would be why um, probably the grant administrator. I think that was something that came up yesterday in a conversation or email. So that could be why um, I'm thinking your. I'm not sure if your ticket was closed, but if you, it probably was redirected to me. Uh, but if you want to just email me that the incident number, and I can take a look. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Yeah. So just keep in mind if you're submitting tickets to update an organization on a converted award or even a new award that already has expenses, it's just not a matter of us updating that because there's additional uh, actions that have to happen. So it's not like we can just do it and close the ticket and move on. There's, I, as we I all know, all these things and updates and IE take a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank oh, you. sorry. Thank you. It sounds like somebody muted by accident. Um, but yeah, it's just, um, I guess I would just need to know the appropriate channel to connect with to get this updated if it isn't pla by placing a ticket through contracts and grants. No, no, it is placing in the ticket. It just, okay. It just Renee, to, I'm was, just saying to be it, patient it that it's not a instant fix. Um, yeah. Uh, it was resolved. The ticket was resolved. And then they asked that I place a ticket with service okay. now. So I'll just forward it to you. Thank you so much. Yes, please do. Okay, thank you. Could I uh in could I step in here, Shaleen? Yep. Yep. Okay. Um I get a lot of tickets that are resolved. Um, but they aren't resolved. And I was wondering if it might be a better practice to have the person who's assigned to that particular ticket reach out and ask, is this resolved with you before they resolve the ticket? Because all we're doing is now we have to go back and figure out what's going on and submit another ticket that's just going to delay the process even further. If if something is not resolved, just reply back to that ticket and it will reopen. Yeah. And, you know, if... I, I know it sounds like a lot to ask. It just... Yeah, but if you reply that ticket, it will reopen it. So then it'll it'll go back and just put what, what you're seeing is not resolved on your end. Okay. Thanks. Because they might be thinking they did resolve it. So well, if you're still seeing issues and that, you know, there might be something further we need to research. Very few of my tickets are actually really resolved. I just want you to know that. Okay. Well, maybe, Shalene, maybe we can yeah. chat later or you could, we can set up a time so you can show me. Um... Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. And it looks like there's another question in the chat wow. regarding final invoices. So if you know a final invoice is coming up and you can submit a ticket, but if a sponsor, you know, if it's due within a few days, um, I would just email the contract administrator. Um, when you do that, you can confirm that all expenses have, have posted as well. So I would just say it has to do with more with the, the timeline of the due date, the urgency, if you're going to submit a ticket or if you're going to email the contract administrator directly. And just one point of clarification, um, the contract administrator for purposes of this discussion is not your SPO contract uh, administrator. Correct. So um, I asked the question about the final invoices. Um, 
I have been contacting the con the contract administrator for that particular award. Um, and if I haven't received a response, is there like a certain amount of business days I should wait for for that contact administrator to get back to me? Or what's the best route for that? Well, I, I'd say it has to do with the, the due date. Um, sometimes we have to go through and we have to do an audit review. And then we may get back to you with some questions. But if it's getting closer and you haven't heard anything, you can try to reach back out or you can send a note to EFA at ucdavis.edu and one of the supervisors will look at it. Okay. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, well, thank you, Mario and CGA team. That was great information. Um, it sounds like a lot of people had questions, so it was very timely. Um, last but not least, Perry, do you have any training updates to share? Yes, I do. Hello, everybody. I just put in the chat a link to a page I'm going to share with you right now. And so, our training opportunities page has all the information that I'm going to cover here. Uh, I just wanted to show you um, a few things here. So upcoming, we have our instructor-led trainings. And so we have a few upcoming. I'll talk about those. The first is um, tomorrow. But I also want to scroll down here and show that these same trainings are offered as e-courses. So some people prefer e-courses, but if you prefer an instructor-led course, we're working through all of these classes in the new academic year. So you'll have your opportunity to sign up for instructor-led um, opportunities. And I just want to point out the Sponsor Programs Essentials class is like the first class you take. And it's a recommended prerequisite for the three classes that are coming up uh, instructor-led. So as I said, we have one that is uh, tomorrow. And if you want to sign up for that, you don't need to take the Sponsored Programs Essentials class. It's a recommended prerequisite, but um, you can take it afterwards if you if you need so you can sign up for this class tomorrow. The ERA class, the Electronic Research Administration uh, class, provides an overview on the use of different research administration systems to prepare and submit uh, research proposals and to manage research awards or subawards. So these are systems like ERA Commons, research.gov, FAST for California proposals. And the class focuses primarily on Cayuse SP, used to route proposals internally for uh, required institutional approvals, and on Cayuse 424, which is linked to grants.gov, and it's used to submit proposals to most federal sponsors. And we're going to have hands-on activities on using both those systems. So then other classes we have coming up. Uh, on August 8th, we have Proposal Preparation and Submission, and this is um, kind of a, a basic course, and it helps you um, get the information you need to prepare and submit a proposal through the Sponsor Programs Office at UC Davis. And then on August 22nd, we have Understanding the Awards Process, which is, uh, again, kind of a basic class on the whole awards process when an award comes in and um, your unit's part in the review, the negotiation and acceptance uh, of that award. So if you want an instructor-led class, sign up for those. And you can always go to the link that's in the chat to see um, all our different upcoming training opportunities. One last thing I'll point out is that all of our e-courses we also offer unlocked versions of them. So if you took a class and there was a section in there that was of interest, you can go to the unlocked version. You won't get um, credit for taking the class, but you can jump to sections that are of interest for you where you want to just refresh yourself on that info or find links that are helpful to you. All right, so um, that's all I have. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take those. Looks like there was one question. Um, Instructor-led, are they in person or on Zoom? They are over Zoom. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Does anybody have anything else they want to share or talk about in this forum? It looks like we have about 20 minutes left. No, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, well, thank you for your time and participation this morning. We really appreciate it. And we will see you all next month. Thanks, Kelly.